than store-bought food. Um, people believe it to be um, more nutritious because it's allowed to, a lot of the vegetables are allowed to ripen right on the vine. They're able to get all of those micronutrients. Uh, people also do it to control the pesticide use, whether it's no pesticides being used or minimal or natural. Um, this way with growing their own, they can make sure that they know exactly what's going into it. Uh, you can also have a variety of things or hard to find things. You can grow things that you can't easily or regularly find in the grocery store. So there's um, a vegetable called a cucamelon and it looks like a little miniature melon and it kind of tastes like a cucumber. Those aren't something that you can easily find in the grocery store. Um, the gardening can also be a really great form of exercise and mental therapy. You do lots of stretching and bending and pulling and lifting and things that you don't normally do when you're, um, I don't know, in quarantine, stuck at home. So it's a way to be able to get out and do some more movements that you don't normally get to do. Um, and it can be fun. It's very satisfying. Being able to watch those little bitty baby plants go from a seed to a fully grown producing uh, zucchini plant is very satisfying. Um, and it can save you money, potentially, maybe, um, depending on how you garden and what sorts of things that you use. It could be more expensive, but there's ways to really do it on the cheap as well. Um, especially if you consider in the chiropractor costs and everything else as we joke. Um, so I would like to start off by going over um, some questions to ask yourself. So some things that I can't answer for you, these are things that you need to do for yourself, but things to consider as you go through figuring out how you wanna garden and what you wanna garden. Um, what are my priorities? Do you want um, a small front yard garden where you have just a little bit of space and you can do some raised beds? Or do you want um, a very large sprawling space? Do you have tons of space to be able to grow on? Um, and yet space really isn't a, an issue for you. Do you like your vegetables perfect? Are they something that um, you want to be out of a beautiful catalog? Or are you okay with um, having some of those funky fruits and the nicks and the dents? And are you okay with having things that might be a little bit ugly? And looking at your space, is it high maintenance? Are you willing to put in a lot of time and energy and space um, to your garden space? Are you okay with um, spending lots and lots of time to make sure that it's just this beautiful space or do you want it a little wild? Are you okay with having um, some flowering weeds in there or uh, just not as clean lines as what some other people may have? And then weeds, like how tolerant are you with weeds? Um, and what is your perspective on weeds? So I absolutely adore dandelions. I adore the wood violets in my yard. They are something pretty. They are flowers and I really enjoy them and they're edible too to boot. Um, but some people just don't like them and that's okay. Do you need to have completely weed-free garden beds? Is that something that's a priority for you? And looking at your inputs, um, do you want to have no pesticides, or herbicides, or sprays, or anything? Are you okay with something a little bit more natural, um, or what we consider as organic? Or is the um, full synthetic um, pesticides and herbicides okay with you? Are you okay um, going in with those, um, the big guns? Um, those are all things that you get to answer for yourself and what you're comfortable with. And what does your space have to offer? So this is an opportunity um, for you to just sit. This is one of my favorite parts of gardening is being able to just sit and observe. Pull up a chair, look at what you have in your space, watch how the sun moves. Where does the sun move? How long do you get sun in these different areas? Where does the water pool when it rains and there's a big rain event, where does that water pool? Where does it go? 
how long does it sit there? Um, and also looking at like any sorts of critters. Do you have a family of deer that like to walk through every night? Do you have a fun little rabbit uh, family underneath your shed? Looking at these and observing these things will help you become more successful in the long run because you can see what's actually going on. Um, and on the note of shade and water, um, sun is really, really important. Um, being able to grow vegetables in the bottom of a woodland probably is not going to work so great. You got to pick things that can handle not a lot of sun. Um, and this, uh, okay. if you try to grow a garden here with all of that water pooling, you're not going to be very successful because the gardens don't generally like to sit in water like that. Um, and then also looking at where you're growing. So in the city, you can um, put some things in that strip between the, the road and the sidewalk, but also know that they have to be really tolerant of salt. We're in Indiana, we use salt on our roadways. There's gonna be salt in the ground and not a lot of plants tolerate salt, but also foot traffic. You have to understand that sometimes people might be walking through. Um, and again, with observation, do you have rabbits? Do you have deer? Do you have little voles and moles and all of these wonderful little critters? They also like to eat your garden. So making sure that you take a few steps to understand how to deter them from coming in and eating all of your lettuce and peas before you do. Um, when you're looking at spaces as well, knowing that there are certain rules, regulations, and codes, oh my, you need to follow these. Um, they're different for different places. Um, in the city of Fort Wayne, we have laws that your grasses cannot be longer than nine inches in the summer and it's enforced by neighborhood code. There's also regulations regarding fences and whether they're ornamental and how far away they are from the road and um, all of these different rules depending on how you're zoned. Um, there are resources online on that Google Drive that I sent you guys information for, um, and it outlines all of those rules and regulations with regards to what you can put up and what you can't put up. And um, you also need to look at whether or not you're part of a homeowners association. Homeowners associations also make sure that you follow certain rules and regulations above and beyond what the city and county require. Um, and if you're outside of those areas, just check in with your um, local municipality to make sure that you're following everything you need to follow. It, um, in the city of Fort Wayne, a lot of the complaint, the um, rules and regulations are complaint based. Um, so making sure that you're on good terms with your neighbors, um, also making sure that it looks good. So if it just isn't very aesthetic, they're not gonna, um, they're gonna be more inclined to want you to make it look pretty, especially if it's in the front yard. Um, and just, it's, uh, it's a courtesy. They don't want a bunch of weed piles um, and weedy things, even if it's food, just making sure that you can make it look good. There's ways to be able to do that. Um, next, we're gonna just talk a little bit about where to locate your garden. So first off, for first beginning, Gardeners, you want to start really, really small. You want to make sure that you're not taken off more than you can chew. Um, that's important because um, at the end of the season, if you're overwhelmed, you might not be as successful. And this way, you can make sure that you're extra super successful and you can always expand. You can always add more, but if you're overwhelmed or stressed or anything else, it's going to be really hard to scale back. Um, I don't know about you, but I want to plant all of the things. And thankfully, um, I, I can scale back a little bit um, because it can get very overwhelming very quickly. When you are picking a spot, you want to have full sun. What does that mean? Full sun. You hear it all the time. You see it on seed packets. Full sun means that you're getting at least six hours of direct sunlight every day. Um, it makes sure that the plants are getting what they need to be able to grow nice and healthy. There are some things that you can grow that are uh, shade tolerant or filter light tolerant, um, but really if you're growing veggies, you want to make sure to have that full sun for at least six hours. And that's where you, you can sit out in that chair and you can read a book, set a timer, see how long you get that sunlight. Um, you want to make sure that the soil is well drained. 
the the picture that I showed earlier with all that water pooling, that's not well drained. That might be more of a place for a rain garden, not a vegetable garden. Um, you want to be careful to um, locate the garden away from any trees or shrubs. Not only is that a source of shade, but they also compete for the sunlight, they compete for nutrients, they compete for water. So just making sure to have a little bit of space from your garden to the trees or shrubs can help make sure that the plants are getting all the resources that they need. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're close to a water source. If you have a big sprawling garden in the backyard, and your nearest spigot is 50 feet away, you're gonna to have to get a long hose. Um, sometimes they put gardens in places that have no access to water. And in that case, you would have to bring in the water. You have to um, walk it in in buckets and it gets tiring and it makes it challenging to be able to water. So just making sure that you have a plan for being able to water those plants, especially early in the season. Once they get established, they don't need as much but when they're those little itty bitty babies, they generally need a, a, a reliable, consistent um, source of water. Um, and then you wanna make sure to avoid any of the um, low lying areas and you wanna make sure that it's pretty flat too. Just, you don't want your soil washing away or your plants if you get a big rain event. Um, I have a question here in the chat box from Olivia. Can gardens be subject to weed laws? Absolutely, yeah. So it's being clear as to what you have growing in your garden and how you have it growing. If you've, um, Some people get around that with having it just in the backyard around behind a fence, um, but you still have to make sure to keep it relatively free of weeds. Um, they consider like poison ivy and ragweed um, dangerous weeds in the city of Fort Wayne and other um, noxious weeds like Canada thistle. Um, and if you have any questions too about um, specific regulations, you can go to that neighborhood code. Um, and we've got that information in that Google Drive. Um, so when you're picking a spot, making sure that um, you're doing that prevention. So this work up front is your prevention. It's making sure that you have a really, really successful garden. Um, so let's get into doing a little bit of garden planning um, layout. So one thing you want to do is make sure to put it down on paper. Um, you, I, you know, I, it's a steel trap up here, right? <laughs> I guarantee you that you will not remember year to year where you planted those zucchinis. Um, it is important to be able to have a paper plan down in question, or down a, a paper plan down so that you can um, know exactly how much seeds to buy and how many plants to buy. Um, when I go to the seeds store, I get really excited and I grab all of the things and then I have enough seeds for 12 years um, and I've bought too much. So having a plan, making sure that you only get exactly what you need and maybe just a little bit more because, you know, impulse buys. Um, if you're coming up with a plan and you want to have a lot of vegetables to be able to harvest, um, try to replace some of those things that you harvest early in the year with some fall crops. So there's um, a document on that Google Drive on how to do intensive gardening and how to follow up stuff. So right now you can plant spinach and you can plant some of those cool crops like chard and peas. And then when they're done, you can plant in tomatoes or you can plant in late season carrots and you can do other things. So it's not just um, a one crop in your plot per year. You can do a, a few things which can help increase how much money you save too in that grocery store bill. Um, making sure to put your tall crops to the north. So those would be any trellis tomatoes, sweet corn, sunflowers. So in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun is more towards the south right now. And if you put those taller crops in the north, it makes sure that it doesn't shade the crops that are behind them or further north. Um, it's helpful to group together any perennial plants. And we'll talk a little bit about some perennials, but perennials are those plants that come back every year without having to replant any seeds. So those would, um, like a tree is considered perennial. You don't have to keep replanting that booger every year. Um, but if you put them all together in your garden, you don't have to worry about 
whether or not when you come in with a tiller or you're doing any spading, they're all together. So it's easier for you to know where they are and you won't inadvertently till them up. And then lastly, rotate crops. That's a really important thing to consider for controlling any disease or weeds um, or insect um, pressures. So you want to make sure to go in um, and get that plan so that you have a rotation. Here we have a four-year rotation. So in this garden, there's four different sections and you can just rotate these four families from year to year and it's a four-year rotation. So it makes sure that the, if you plant tomatoes, which are really susceptible to a disease called early blight, which kills it's a fungal disease that kills the plant, um, the leaves of the plant as it goes up from the bottom to the top. If you rotate out every year, you'll have less likelihood of getting those um, such severe disease. Um, but that's true for a lot of things. Diseases like to stay in the soil and the plant residues that you may have left behind. Uh, So we've got a couple of questions. Is it too late for asparagus? It's not too late for asparagus. We'll discuss a little bit about specific crops in a little bit. Um, deterrence for rabbits. We've got lots of publications on that. Um, and I can go ahead and put that in the Google Drive when we're done here. Um, there's lots of different ways to deter, but really the best deterrent is occlusion or exclusion. So putting up a fence, making sure they just can't get in there, making sure it's a really secure um, fence that they can't dig under. Um, they don't jump very high, so a nice three foot one would be fine. Um, and I have a question, what do you mean by rotate? So um, that is a great question. So we've got, like here you've got, say this is this year, we've got our cabbage family um, and rutabagas all planted in here. And then We've got bean family, potato family, root family. So what that means is that next year, you want to make sure to rotate it. So your cabbage family goes from this plot to this next one where the beans were. And then it rotates through just like that every year. So next we're going to get into, you guys have lots of questions. So hold on to those questions till the end. Let me get through. Um, I plan on talking for another about 20 minutes or so, and then we've got about 45 minutes where you guys can hit me with questions, all right? <clears throat> Next is selecting your plants. Number one, most important thing to consider when selecting your plants, plant what you like to eat. I don't care if you think that you're going to eat fennel. If you don't like it, don't plant it. And don't think that you're gonna palm that stuff off on your neighbors either, I'm telling you, nobody likes that stuff. And kale, who actually likes kale? I'm joking, I love kale. Um, but make sure that you plant what you like to eat. Um, if you don't like tomatoes, don't plant tomatoes. They may be gorgeous, but plant what you're gonna eat. Um, when you wanna decide what, you, what kind of plants and different, there's so many different varieties out there. Take a look at those seed catalogs, look online. Um, I do have to put a, a stipulation though right now with the current climate that we're in, seed companies are only selling to commercial growers. It's hard for home gardeners to be able to find seeds directly from seed companies. Um, but other ways that you can get seeds is through asking friends or neighbors. I know there's some great groups on social media where there's some seed sharing going on if you have seeds and want to share them for others. Um, once the libraries do open, there's the little free seed library at the Little Turtle Branch, and it's just a depository of seeds that people can take for their use. Um, and then also check out the big box stores um, and local nurseries and greenhouses. A lot of them have seed racks and are still selling seeds for gardeners to be able to use. All right, so that's all the planning stuff. Let's like actually talk about getting dirty. First off, do you got grass to get rid of? I'm um, if you do, which if you've never gardened before, that can be a really important first step. 
some people will go through and they'll spray it with an herbicide. Depending on the herbicide and how much you apply, that can get pretty pricey. So, and some people don't necessarily want to have the herbicide residues where they're growing their food. Um, I do have to say the Roundup um, in their tests are shown safe after about a day after you spray it so you can plant other things and they'll grow. Other thing you can do is called solarization, which is just putting down a tarp, preferably clear, and then the sunlight bakes the crap out of it. That one can be a little bit more challenging as well. It can take a lot of time. It's most successful in the summer. Probably not your option right now. Um, <clears throat> if you have the resources, you can do sheet composting. There's a graphic here with um, it's a variation on the lasagna gardening. So you can start off and you put down a thin la a layer of cardboard and then you put on top of it your different lasagna layers. So in here you've got grass clippings and green leaves and um, compost and uh, wood mulch. And it's got um, lots of different layers into it. And then that way you don't have to worry about competing with the soil, but you're also not growing in in the soil at that point, it's kind of like a raised bed. Um, and then you can just physically remove it. So you can go in with a sod cutter or a shovel and just shovel it out. Just take it out, you can compost it. Or what I like to do is I find other bare spots in my yard and I fill it in with it. Next thing you wanna do is then break up the soil. Um, going in with a shovel or a spade, um, if you have access to big machinery, this big guy right here is a big old tiller. Um, that thing's a beast. It's heavy. Um, they can get pretty expensive as well if you're purchasing one for yourself. But if you know a friend that has one, they can come in and till it for you. Um, a shovel is a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of fun, though, too. Like, you get quite the workout with the shoveling and turning it over. Um, but you want to make sure that the ground is able to be worked. You want to make sure that it's not too wet. Um, in Indiana, we've got tons of clay soil, so it's an opportunity um, for the soil to stay wet a little bit longer, and you want to make sure that it's nice um, and healthy. Oh, yes, and absolutely, call 811 and get everything um, mapped out in your yard before you dig. You want to make sure that you don't have any lines underneath. <clears throat> Living out in the country, um, where I used to live, uh, we didn't have to worry about any of that because we didn't have any lines behind our house where we were planting. So yes, thank you for that reminder on 811. Um, this is a graphic here for um, how wet and when the soil is ready versus too wet. Um, if you put it into a ball and it stays um, real thick, like the clay soils will generally stay like that for a while. But if you can wring it out and have water come out, kind of like a little bit of a sponge that's too wet, if it's able to be broken apart and it's not um, really saturated, then that's just right. You don't want to work in a soil that's really wet like this because you'll compact everything and you'll make it so that the roots can't get through um, the soil. Um, so you want to make sure that it's not as wet so you don't compact that soil. Um, after that, you want to do a little bit of amending. So um, if you're putting any fertilizers down, you want to make sure to get a soil test first, but generally they recommend four pounds of nitrogen per a thousand square feet. Um, and then that includes math. Um, but that's the general recommendation for what you're going to apply. You can also apply any kind of amendments of organic matter or um, <clears throat> the compost, dried animal manures. You can use uh, leaves to add to it. So there's different ways to be able to add it to make it a little bit more um, workable in the long run. It helps with the soil health. Um, there's lots of products on the market as well that help um, with adding organic matter and make it a little easier to work with. After you're done with adding the amendments, adding soil organic matter to like kind of doing that deep spading, um, you want to make sure to level out the soil just to make it easier to work with. Um, do a soil rate, kind of get rid of any of those residues. If you're putting seeds in the ground, they don't like to compete with a lot of the different junk that can be in there um, in the planting area. Make sure Two, I don't know about you guys, but I like to have nice straight rows. It makes it easier for me to weed around and manage with tools. I don't like to be on my hands and knees all the time weeding. I like to use some tools that allow me to stand up. 
you have nice straight rows, um, like using a stick with some string attached to it, it makes it a lot easier to be able to use some of those um, standing tools. And it just looks good. Like I'm not very particular about straight rows, but gosh, if those garden beds aren't straight, it just irks me. And I don't want to sit out on my patio and look at those lines that are going wonky all over the place. Next thing to consider is raised beds. Raised beds would be a way to be able to not have to worry a lot about breaking up that lawn or any of the grass that you might have. You can put these raised beds um, right on top of where the turf was, um, put a layer of cardboard down and then add just like that lasagna gardening stuff and plant in. It also helps with drainage. So this will dry out a little bit faster than the rest of the soil. So you can work the soil a little bit sooner and get stuff in a little bit quicker. And then here's a picture of the farm beds that we have at the farm. We used um, an unstructured mounded bed system. So it's kind of like a raised bed, but we don't have any structures on the side. We depend on the plant matter to be able to hold it together and a, a little bit of faith. Um, but it's a way for us to be able to grow and have the soil dry out a little bit sooner, a little bit easier. Um, and then the next thing to consider, just a quick shout out, is container gardening. I could do a whole class on container gardening because there's lots of things to consider, but just know that this is an opportunity, like even if you have just a patio, you can throw some pots out there, throw some plants in there. There are different plants that are actually developed now for containers, and a lot of the seeds packets have a little emblem on them that say for container gardening. You can use all sorts of different um, containers. These are Rubbermaid containers. You just want to make sure that there's drainage, making sure that there's holes in the bottom because you don't want the water to pool. And never, ever, ever use um, soil, like soil that you get out of your backyard in these things. You want a mixture of um, potting soil to be able to put into these. And then when you're ready, you can plant some seeds. So here you see those nice straight rows with the string and then they're using a hoe to make a nice furrow. You want to make sure to read the seed packet um, so that it's, uh, you're not making it too deep or too shallow. Um, here they're standing on a board and this is just a way to make sure you're not compacting the soil. It distributes your weight just a little bit more, um, but you make that nice little furrow. Once it's all ready, um, we've got being able to plant your seeds. So again, this is reading your seed packets. Um, they've got all the information on where to plant, when to plant, how deep to plant. Um, larger seeds generally need to get planted deeper. Um, general rule is you plant about a um, width to a width and a half of the seed in its depth. So if smaller seeds get planted a little further up in the soil, larger seeds a little further down. Once you have that, then you can cover them up with soil, um, water them in, and away they go. Um, when you're reading the seed packets, here's an example of some evergreen bunching onions that I had. Um, you can see down here, days to harvest um, is 60 to 65 days, so that'll tell you that it's going to take about 60 to 65 days before you can harvest. This one's a container variety, um, so you can plant it in a container. Um, but the one that I really like to look at is the depth and the spacing. So this tells you that these seeds can be planted about a half inch deep and you want them to be um, about 12 inch rows and 12 inch spacings in the row. Um, you've got in here too how what time of year to be able to harvest or what time of year to be able to plant. So these can be planted from March to May so you can go ahead and plant them um, now. These are things that'll be good now. They won't die off with the snowstorm that we have coming tomorrow, um, and they'll do really, really well with these cold weather. And then, I don't know about you guys, but I get extra excited and impatient, and when I'm putting seeds directly into the ground, I usually plant them a little too heavily. Um, if you've got plants that are coming up a little too close together, you want to do some thinning. So here are carrots and you can go through and just pull out the carrots to make sure that the rest of the ones that you leave in there have enough space to be able to grow. 
most crops you want to do this for making sure that when they're still young to be able to thin them but don't compost those those little buggers are delicious you can make some delicious pesto with those baby carrot tops or you can just saute them up they're quite tasty um, also consider um, doing seed starting indoors these are for some of those longer season crops tomatoes and peppers and eggplants um, that requires a little bit more skill and a little bit more equipment than just putting seeds directly in the ground um, but it's a consideration. Um, and this is a picture of my seed starting area. I don't have, it's not real high tech. I just got some LED shop lights. They're not the greatest, but they work. And I put it in front of a window to help supplement some of the light. Um, it's just what I have. And I, I do, I do things that work for me. Um, and just knowing too, that doing a little bit of experimenting can help too. So when it comes time to planting your plants, um, you wanna dig a hole. When you've got um, your plants started, either you can get them from a nursery or you can start them yourselves, um, but you plant a hole that's just a little bit bigger than that root ball, the, the, um, what's in the container, the part that already has soil on it. Um, you can test the, put the plant in there and you can test it when it's still in the pot to see if it's deep enough or too deep. Um, but once it's ready, you go ahead and put it in there. Um, and you wanna make sure that the plant isn't too high or too low. You wanna keep that um, soil level roughly at where it was. There really is only one plant that likes to get put in deeper than where that soil level is and those are tomatoes. Tomatoes, you can put, three feet under the ground as long as it's got some leaves sticking out it'll still grow um, but every other plant really can't handle going any deeper than what it was at when you do plant it make sure to remove any of the um the pots that are around it so the you want to make sure especially your plastic pots um anything that won't decompose you want to make sure to remove otherwise the plant's not going to survive um, and also as a warning for peat pots, those compostable pots, or even the, what are they, the jiffy, those things that you put in the water and they expand huge little jiffy discs. Um, the roots sometimes have a hard time getting through those. So making sure to kind of rip them up a little bit um, and so that the plant roots can get out. And here they talk about also um, ripping off that top layer that you have here. So this you want to rip off because it acts as a wick and it'll take that moisture and put it out into the air and not keep it in the soil where it was. So you want to make sure either remove it or keep it covered with soil. Once you have it in the ground, you water the little babies in. They like to have a little bit of drink so that their tender little baby roots don't dry out um, and so that the roots can have really good contact with the soil. You don't want any air pockets in there. Um, large air pockets because then the roots can die in there. They like to have the nice little um, areas um, filled and have good contact with the soil around it. So let's talk a little bit about growing stuff. I'm just going to do a quick shout out for herbs. Herbs are something that you can grow. They're delicious. They're wonderful. That's all I'm going to say about herbs. <laughs> um, just making sure that you know the difference um, between the perennial ones, the ones that will keep coming back. Um, there are some that are aggressive, like mints. Mints are hard to get rid of once you plant them in the soil in your garden. They work a lot like a weed. And then there's ones that also self seed. So just know that herbs are a thing. And then we have perennial crops. So that's your asparagus, your rhubarb, your strawberries. Asparagus is a great springtime vegetable that comes up, produces those lovely little spears. Um, they are delicious, cooked and grilled and um, even fresh. I usually just eat them right out of the garden. Um, but that's just, I like a little dirt with my, my vegetables. Um, it can take a couple of years to establish asparagus, um, but it's something that will continue to grow pretty easily. When they mature after the spears, they grow into these giant monstrosities of plants, these wonderful fern, delicate foliage. So just know that you wanna keep that on there. Don't cut that back until it's um, the end of the season is, and is browned and died off, um, cause that's how the plant gets all its energy for the next year. Rhubarb's another one. I don't know whether to call rhubarb a fruit or a vegetable. You put it with lots of sugar, so we'll call it a fruit. 
Um, but this is what rhubarb looks like. You can eat this stalk. You don't want to eat the leaf. The leaf has some wonderful toxins in it that'll give you an upset stomach. Um, but it is a great um, crop. They're starting to come now. Um, they're an early spring crop that you can harvest. And then strawberries are another perennial plant that you can put in and get years and years of excitement. Um, the great thing with strawberries is that they have these runners. So they put off um, these little baby daughter plants and this is how they keep going. So you can keep producing stra new strawberry plants and with these runners. Um, I'm starting to get hungry already looking at all of these fruits and veggies. Uh, next is annuals. So annuals are something that needs to get replanted every year. It does not last through the winter. Um, it will die off in the winters that we have here. We just get a little too cold. For cool season, um, there are crops that pe can be put in the ground now. Um, so, oh, there's a question about keeping the birds away from uh, strawberries specifically. You can put bird netting over the top. Um, that's really the only way is to exclude them um, by putting some netting. You wanna make sure that it's secured really well, otherwise the birds can get trapped into it, um, but that's really the best way. Or just get them before, get the strawberries before the birds do. Um, so your cool season crops, those are crops that can be planted, some of them just as soon as you can work the ground. Um, they can handle a lot of that cold and the wet and the nastiness. As long as the ground is workable, they can be put in. We've got two resources, the Indiana Vegetable Planting Guide um, and the Seed Starting uh, Date Calculator from Johnny's Selected Seeds. Those are um, resources are both in the Google Drive. If you look at the Indiana Vegetable Planting Calendar, it looks kind of like this in part of the section and it lists the crops over here in Northeast Indiana. We're in Area D and it tells you when you can plant things. So you've got um, snap beans. If you go across, you can start planting those May 10th. But we're looking at cool season crops, so we want stuff that you can plant a little earlier, right? So what can we plant now? We could plant Chinese cabbage. You can start planting those as early as April 1st. Um, we also have in here an April 1st for um, chives. Um, we've got corn salad is another early April 1st one. Uh, there's lots of different stuff that you can plant really, really early. And this is a great resource to be able to see what, um, what crops you can plant and when. Here's um, a quick list of some of the cool season crops. I'm going to just fly through it so you can see it. Um, we've got broccoli. Um, this is, if you're not aware, this is how broccoli grows grows on a stalk and at the top is the broccoli. If you let it go too far, it'll start flowering into these beautiful yellow flowers. It's still edible, but you wanna, if you really want broccoli, you wanna get it before it starts to flower. Brussels sprouts are another cool season crop that you can put in and they produce the cute little buds right along the stem here. You can see the little baby Brussels sprouts there. It's really, these are a really great one to do with the kids too because they can see where the Brussels sprouts are coming from and then you might actually be able to convince them to eat Brussels sprouts. Cabbages um, come in all different shapes and colors. They've got purples and greens and the Ripley Savoy one. Um, you want to make sure to harvest them before they go to flower though because when they flower that head will actually like split open and the flower stalk will come out of the middle. You can still eat it, but it just doesn't look great. You know, I haven't been very successful. There's a comment from Joan. I haven't been very successful with broccoli either. Um, a lot of the pests that you have with those are, um, it could be flea beetles, it could be the white, um, butterflies, there's a lot of different pests that come on it. So just identifying what pests you have and being able to do different things to deter them is best. Cauliflower um, is another one. It grows similar to broccoli, but if you want that nice white head, you gotta kind of tie that those leaves up once you start seeing the head forming so that the sun doesn't get to it. Otherwise you're gonna have kind of like a green uh, cauliflower. Kalrabi. Kalrabi is one of those crops that you don't see very often. It's getting a little bit more popular, which is so cool. Um, but you've got greens and purples, and it's just this swollen stem um, along the plant, and you can eat it. Kind of tastes like um, 
like a radish without the heat or uh, broccoli stem. Lettuces, peas. I've already had peas in the ground for about a month now. They're doing great. Potatoes, potatoes we put in last week. Um, those are a crop that can handle being in the soil and they come up once it starts to warm up a little bit more. <clears throat> Where do you plant seed potatoes? We do plant um, potatoes. Um, a lot of the stores I've been noticed um, hearing a lot of like the smaller nurseries have them. Um, some of the big box stores at Purdue Extension, we can't specifically endorse different businesses, but there are um, different supply stores that still have seed potatoes available for planting. And you want to plant them now, right now. And for like the next month, you can plant them, but now works good or yesterday. <laughs> radishes, radishes come in all different colors. And these are so fun because they're quick. You can plant a radish seed and harvest one of those radishes in 20 days. 20 to 23 days is one of the lowest ones. These are fun to do with the kids because they can see these little buggers growing quick. Spinach, um, get those spinach greens like Popeye, cool season crop that does really, really well in the cool. <clears throat> One thing you have to be careful is bolting. A lot of these things, if it gets warm, they'll produce flowers. As soon as this is a head of lettuce, as soon as that lettuce starts to produce those flowers, that lettuce is gonna be bitter and you're not gonna to wanna to eat it. Ugh. You can, you just, it's not very tasty. And then next is warm season crops. So these you wanna plant after the soil warms. In Northeast Indiana, that's about May 10th to May 15th. Mother's Day is the general rule and when to plant these things. Um, and here is that same little graph that we we're looking at before. So some of the Mother's Day crops through the May 10th. So you've got snap beans, um, you've got chicory, you wanna plant a little bit later, they like it hot. Sweet corn is another one you don't wanna plant until after Mother's Day. Um, so here we'll just quick go through some of these warm season crops. You've got uh, snap beans, green ones and purple ones, and then you can do your dry beans. There's pole beans and bush beans. The pole beans need something to climb up. The bush beans you can just plant. Cucumbers, there's lots of different varieties of cucumbers. There's round ones and white ones and little ones and large ones and long ones. And um, there, it's, it gets exciting when you get to pick out what kind of cucumbers you want. Eggplant. Um, again, with um, the one thing I love about vegetables is there's so much variety and eggplant is one of those as well. There's tons of variety. But remember that these are um, in the same family as tomatoes and potatoes. So you want to make sure to rotate with those. Watermelon is a great one. Again, lots of variety, but you want a lot of space for these. These buggers take up a lot of space and they'll climb and reach and stretch. They'll take over. When you're looking at watermelon, you know, the best way to be able to tell that it's ripe is looking at where it was contacted with the soil. If it's nice and creamy, like a nice butter, then you know that the sugar should be nice and well-developed and the flavor should be good. If it's still kind of snow white, it's not going to be great. Okra. At Tani May Farm, we grow tons of okra. We can't grow enough okra. Um, people love okra but it's this beautiful plant with these gorgeous flowers and then they produce the okra on this um, stalk and where you can harvest them. You wanna get them when they're kind of small, but they love that heat. Peppers, there's bell peppers and hot peppers and sweet peppers and all sorts of peppers. Um, pumpkins are another warm season crop you wanna plant once it warms up. Um, all different varieties again with those and those like watermelon take up a lot of space and they sprawl pretty far. Tomatoes um, <clears throat> need a lot of um, support if you don't want to because they do are susceptible to a lot of diseases so you want to make sure to support them to be able to get, have good airflow and keep those tomatoes off the ground but man if you are able to trellis them and you're able to have different tomatoes. There's so much variety in color and shape and size and flavor. It is just, if you don't like tomatoes, you're wrong. It is delicious. Um, nothing better than going out to the garden and throwing one of those cherry tomatoes in your mouth when it's still warm with the sun and it explodes with the flavors. And summer squash. Um, 
this is one of those plants that you get to share with all of your neighbors too. Um, I'm greedy, I like to keep all my summer squash, but there's lots of different shapes here. This one's a fun one, it's called Patty Pan. It's great for the kids because it looks like little spaceships. Um, but there's greens and yellows and rounds and squats. Um, and here's what the plant looks like and inside is where the um, summer squash grow. You want to harvest them when they're still young. Um, if you let them go and they start to develop a thick skin, that's when we call them winter squash. So winter squash are in the same family, it's just they've been let on the plant a lot longer. Um, and these have been bred specifically for that thick skin, the long storage, and the delicious flavors when they mature. Sweet corn um, is a great one to be able to grow. You want to grow them in blocks. You want to grow them together um, because of how they pollinate. There's all different kinds of varieties and there's lots of ways to be able to tell whether or not they're ready for harvest. They do the thumbnail test um, to make sure that they're ready to be able to harvest. You want to make sure that um, the sap is not thick and doughy. That means that it's past its prime. So if the, it's, um, you kind of want a milky sap and that means that it's ready. If it's kind of thick and chunky and starchy, that means that the sugars have turned into starches and it won't be as sweet and what you know is um, sweet corn. And then we have sweet potatoes. They like that heat. Um, they like to grow. They're a tropical plant. So you want to make sure um, that's how they differ from regular potatoes. Storage potatoes you want to plant now. Sweet potatoes you don't want to plant until later because they're from the tropics. And then we have dual season crops. These crops can tolerate both the cool and the warm season. These are beets and carrots and collard greens and onions. Beets you can plant and harvest their greens early or you can let them mature to get those beautiful bulbs. Carrots are a great one to grow. A lot of them do really really well in containers. Loads of different colors. Collard greens are a big grower and at the farm we again we can't grow enough of collard greens but that's considered a dual season crop that can handle both the cool and the heat. Onions, um, onion sets, you want to plant onion sets now. Um, it's already getting a little late for onion seeds. If you're doing onion seeds right now you're doing green onions. They won't really produce that really great bulb that you want. Um, and then in this picture down here you can see the tops have fallen over, that's when you know that they're ready to harvest as they've fallen over. And then you have to look into some how to cure them and there's resources online on how to cure these things. And then Swiss chard, it's a great, um, it, it tastes kind of like beet greens. Um, it, it, uh, it comes in lots of different colors as well. They have the rainbow chard. Rainbow is my favorite color. Um, and it, it, this crop comes in purples and reds and yellows and whites and it, it's a pop, it pops when you walk by. You can use it as an edible landscaping. It's a great plant. It goes really well in containers as well. Uh, so just an overview, talk about what we, uh, what we talked about here. So why do you garden? How do you select a good site? Um, we meandered through coming up with a good garden plan, uh, talked about preparing your garden space a little bit, and then we took a nice tour to edibles. Um, if you're looking for more information, all of it's available on that Google Drive, which you've linked to, and you can download any of that information. Um, this is a list of some of the resources that are in there. Um, and then there's a website as well that you can go to that has even more information. If you guys find yourself stuck and you have questions, um, or if you're having issues and you'd like to talk it out, we have the Master Gardener Hotline. They are here to help. We've got the email and uh, voicemail that you can leave a message, and the Master Gardeners here in Allen County will get back at you. This is only available for people in Allen County, by the way. Um, and we have more information at the Bitly Garden questions. And with being from Purdue, I want to do um, a quick little pitch about our Purdue Fast Start program. So if you have any students that are in high school, um, if you go through the Fast Start program, which is a free program, it assures admission into the Purdue University. And then if you need more vegetables, you just weren't able to grow enough for yourself and you're looking for some more vegetables, go ahead and check out Johnny May Farm. Um, we're on the southeast side. We're going to be starting our farm stand Fridays in June through October. Uh, keep an eye on social media for um, when we start and what we have. And now we have gotten to the questions portion. 
<sighs> wow, you guys have lots of questions. <laughs> hey, Terry, I, uh, if I can jump in real quick, I was writing down the questions as they came through on the chat. Would you like oh. me to read those to you or um, send them to you and you can answer some of the ones that came in while you were talking? Uh, yeah, do you, sure. Let's hit it. What you got? Okay. Let's see. Um, what if you plant your garden in your backyard and there's an alley that has trees across from your garden uh, or across from you? Uh, this person's garden didn't grow very well last year and they think that might be the problem. Um, so it's on the other side of the alley? Is that what you said? It looks like it, yeah. Okay. Um, chances are that's not a problem. The alley might be more of your problem. Um, some of the stuff that's on the roadway. But if you have specific questions, I welcome you to send in some pictures to the Master Gardener Hotline, which is also available in that, um, if you guys go to the Google Drive, there's a helpful links um, and information sheet and in there is all the information for the master guard line master gardener hotline and so much more so you're saying master gardeners are a good resource for like figuring out whether your spot is good for gardening yes yep Excellent. okay uh the next one came from robin they said uh how do you keep chipmunks out oh well the country girl in me first wanted to say a bb gun but <laughs> Um, and just scare them off with it. The chipmunks, so they, a lot of times what I like to do, because they, chipmunks usually are a problem for me with digging up the soil, um, and not so much eating. Sometimes they'll eat, but not very often. So what I like to use is, um, uh, chili pepper. Uh, it's, uh, I sprinkle it on because they don't like, they get it in their paws and their mouths and they don't like how it tastes and feels and it deters them. That would deter me. Okay. Uh, question from Reed. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one from Barb. Anything special I can do to grow tomatoes? I've got well water and never had any luck growing them, even though I keep them watered. You might be watering them too much. Um, it's hard to say. So uh, it may be a soil problem. It may be a tomato variety problem. It may be too, like, not enough light problem. There's a lot of things that could go into that. So um, if you email the Master Gardener Hotline, they can get you some resources for how to grow tomatoes really, really well. Excellent. Okay. One from Reed. Uh, what do you add to the soil to make it workable? I think this came up when you were talking about how Indiana soils tend to have so much clay. Yeah, compost is really great. Um, shredded leaf litter can work really well. Um, yeah, those are my two biggest ones and just kind of working with it. One thing I do too is when I plant things, um, I don't pull the whole plant out unless um, it's a tomato, like those I don't leave in the ground because of diseases, but mm -hmm. I'll like, I'll leave the roots in there to help add with the organic matter. Okay. Now I've seen it uh, like uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards, they have these huge big bags of dirt. Is that something that's good to add like uh, mulch or compost or peat moss, I think? <laughs> Those are three different things. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you can add garden soil. Um, it doesn't, it's not really going to do a lot for you. Um, you can add compost. That would be a great thing to be able to add. Um, peat moss is another thing that will help with um, not only adding the organic matter and making the soil a little bit better, but it also helps because generally our soil pHs tend to run on the high side. It'll help lower it. Okay. This question actually came from me while you were talking. I had a question. Am I allowed yeah. to ask questions for me? Okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, I've heard that some city soils can be contaminated with like old lead paint and stuff like that. Is there a way to get it tested or some way to avoid it completely? Is it okay to plant in, in the ground in the city? Um, there are some spots that are higher. Um, in the city of Fort Wayne, generally, we are not at dangerously high levels. I haven't seen any spots, not to say that it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen any areas that are truly dangerously high. Um, but the best way to be able to lessen those risks 
or with raised beds and bringing in your own soil. Um, you okay. can test, but those can get pretty expensive as well. Um, it usually tends to be about $40 a test. Okay. A question from Jamie it says, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear more about the best plant or combination of plants for container gardening. Oh, well, um, the, if I don't have the resources up on the drive, but there is tons of information on companion planting. Um, they have entire charts of it that really show what plants go together really, really well. Okay. And is that something the master gardeners could help with too? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, this one, uh, do potatoes need full sun? Sure do. They can handle um, a little, they can handle a little bit of shade, but they really, at least six hours would be optimum. Excellent. Okay. Uh, another question from me. Uh, you said something about trellising tomatoes. What is a trellis tomato? So that's giving it some sort of structure to be able to grow on. So if you go to the, the store and you see those tomato cages, um, that's considered a trellis. So that's something that you can put around the tomato plant that'll help and then you can guide the tomato up. Um, and that's what a trellis is. There are other ways that you can trellis them. At the farm, we use a post um, and between each post is three plants and then we use string and it's called basket weaving. So we weave the plants into the string that goes between the two posts. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just two more here on, on the stuff that we had while you were talking. Uh, uh, somebody said, I saw lemon on the cucumber slide that you had up. Uh, yeah. Do those taste lemony? No, they just kind of look lemony. Um, uh, I think um, anecdotally, I think that um, some people think they taste like lemons because they look like lemons. Like how much of what we look at and see as we're eating influences what we taste, but there's really, I don't, it might be a little bit more acidic than regular ones, but it's really not like a true lemon flavor. Okay. Um, I actually have two more now. Uh, can I control vine borers? I keep losing zucchini, squash, etc. I also have a problem with aphids and spider mites. Is there any way to control, the, control those? Fire. <laughs> <laughs> So those are horrible. Um, with zucchini and the, vine, the boars being diligent and making sure you find them, you can actually like cut them out of the vine and then reroot and pull, like get the bug out of the vine. Stink bugs, um, there's different sprays that you can use. Um, those are a lot harder to be able to control. What I've had really good success with is um, starting an early season summer squash and then they attack those. Um, and as they're attacking those, I plant some other ones on the other side um, and they usually get away from getting the stink bugs and the vine borers because they're too busy at the other ones they're already chomping on. So timing when you plant things and doing it a little bit later can help um, and they usually die off by then. Uh, okay. What was the other hand to your hand? Um, aphids and spider mites. Yeah, those um, <sighs> water, you can spray them off if you don't want to uh, use any like insecticides, but there are some deterrents like neem is a really great all purpose kind of deterring um, insecticide that works really, really well. That's easy on the pocketbook, easy on the ecosystem. Um, okay. Otherwise, just spraying them off with water makes them angry. Okay. So last question here on the stuff that was during your presentation. Um, Linda asked, can you put strawberries in containers? Oh yeah, they do great in containers. Um, one thing that I did neglect was to say with the container is you really have to be careful with uh, watering. Containers can dry out really quickly. And that's usually, I try, I don't, I don't have a lot of success with containers because I get distracted and I don't water them as often as they need to get watered. And so making sure to water them really well and keeping them watered. But yeah, strawberries do great in containers. All right. So that's all the questions we had during the, uh, while you were going through the slides. Theory. If you go to the Zoom chat, it looks like around 2.53 is um, when some of the, the other questions pick up. Great. Oh, Terry. Hi. Yes. This is Hi. Chris. 
doing your presentation. I don't know, I guess my, maybe I'm not doing some right because I didn't hear my questions. Um, I asked about, um, number one, could you put up the Master Garden hotline number again? And another deterrent for um, Ken, this is not so much dealing with vegetables, but does hostas make a good plant for pot containers. I had them initially all along the north side of my house, which is pretty shaded. But I think between rabbits and an invasive ground cover that I had eventually over four or five years, they were all killed. Um, I'm trying to find another way to grow them. Yeah, hostas won't do great in containers. Most okay. things don't do great in containers. Uh, because it gets too cold in the winter mm -hmm. and it will die off in the container versus if that plant was in the ground it it's a lot more protected in the yes. ground I just I don't I wouldn't think that it would be able to survive that okay. um, and I did go ahead and put the master gardener hotline information I see in the it. chat um, and it's also available on that Google Drive okay great all right so um, to the questions in the chat, we've got, does Johnny May farm sell seeds or just vegetables that we grow? Um, we do have some seeds left over that were donated last year that we'll be giving away again this year um, when the farm stand opens in June. Um, and we will also have hopefully some plants to sell as well. Um, where can I find the table of when to plant different plants? If you look in the Google Drive that I sent you guys, there is the vegetable planting, Indiana vegetable planting calendar. So that's all available there. Um, when prepping the soil, can you use newspaper instead of cardboard or is the ink bad? Most inks that are used in the newspapers are soy-based inks and they're good. They're good to use. I like using newspaper. Um, you just wanna make sure not to use like, the coupon section or the ads that are glossy you want to keep just to the newspaper section. Can I plant potatoes in straw? I have seen that. I haven't tried it. You can also plant like tomatoes and peppers in straw as well. Um, I say give it a try. Again, the dry out, like it'll dry out a lot quicker than if you had it just in the soil, but it's a um, I think it would be an easy way to harvest then. You don't have to worry about digging for potatoes. Uh, zucchini and stink bugs. We did talk about that. There are pesticides. Um, I believe neem is one that we used to be able to deter stink bugs and zucchini and summer squash. Um, just peruse, like go to your whatever store that you get your garden supplies from um, and make sure to check the label. The best thing to be able to do is making sure to read the label before you apply any pesticides, making sure that anything that you want to use is use it on is listed. So you want to make sure that zucchini and stink bugs are listed on um, as a target to be able to use the product for. <sighs> is it safe to grow a garden in the yard where the ground is treated for weeds? It depends on um, what sort of weed killer that they're using. So making sure wherever it's being grown that you contact the company or you look at the label if you're applying it yourself to see what product's being used and see whether or not it can be used with vegetables. It'll all say that on the label. How to rotate perennials. Great thing with those is you don't have to. Perennials just stay put. You don't include those in the um, the rotation. You want to make sure to rotate everything else though. The perennials get their one little section of the garden and then you rotate all of your annuals. Uh, I haven't been able to produce zucchini fruit lately. Wonderful flowers but no fruit. Um, that might be a pollinator issue. You may not have enough pollinators nearby. Um, or if somebody, if there's being spray that's taking out the pollinators, that might be an issue. Um, <clears throat> can clay soil grow plants or can potting soil be used? 
clay soil can be grown. You just gotta work a little harder, like all of Northeast Indiana's clay soil. Um, so stuff grows, we got it. Um, you just have to work to be able to um, get the soil to be a little bit better, adding those amendments, the compost. Uh, when should I start hardening off my seedlings? Um, after the snowstorm would be good. You can start hardening those off. Um, I think when I was looking at the weather next week, looks like we're going to be trending back into the temperatures that we expect without snow. Um, so start hardening them off now, getting them ready to be outside, and just keeping an eye on that weather. If it's supposed to dip down, bring them inside for the night. Uh, does rust from your garden hose damage plants from watering? I don't think so. I've used rusty hoses before and I've never had issues. Um, if you're concerned, um, it asks, should I get a filter for my hose? Um, if you're concerned, I'd probably just get a new hose versus a filter for it if you can. Um, if you've got really poor waters where you would want to get a filter, but I don't see a little bit of rust on the hose being an issue. And well water is in general okay for gardening. It is. You just want to make sure that there's not too many minerals and um, different things in your well water. Just get your soil test. Um, some, some people with well water need to get it filtered before they put it through into their garden. So um, getting the soil or the getting the water test will be able to tell you how many soluble solids you have. Um, this is so much fun. You guys bopped around with all these questions. <laughs> I feel like I got ADD here. Uh, with your, your question about water, does the same apply for city water? City water is pretty great. Um, city of Fort Wayne is um, generally a great source of water. I haven't had a lot of issues. There's a little bit of soluble solids in there, but it's not too bad. Um, it can be a problem with container gardening and getting some, what you might see is like on your house plants or in containers having like a layer of, it looks like salt or a white crust on the top. And from there, you just want to do a nice, good soak. Soak it all the way through. Uh, I think I had cabbage loopers. Those little buggers are the worst, aren't they? On cauliflower last year. Any natural ways to get rid of these guys? Uh, you could pick them off, but that would take forever because they're small. Um, you can try to encourage um, other insects to come eat them or birds. Um, I've had really great success with decreasing populations through beneficial plantings. Um, getting in a lot of those great um, pollinator plants can be helpful so that other insects come in and eat them. I'm going to just turn off my light. I'm seeing that I'm a little stroby here. Ah, that's better. Um, there are different sprays that you can spray on it that are more natural and different clay products that you can use that deters them. Um, so just looking, there's so many products, um, but generally they're just a pain in the butt. Uh, love Johnny May Farms. Yeah, me too. Um, all right, next question. I started growing tomato, lettuce, and peppers inside the house in a long flower bed. When will I transplant them? When will I transplant them or do I thin them out? I don't understand the question entirely. So um, you can thin them out now because you don't want them growing too closely to each other. Um, it was my question if you want better understanding. Yes, please. Okay. In three separate flowering boxes, yes. I planted from seed, lettuce, tomato, and peppers. Now they're starting and tomatoes there's probably 50 of them in like a two and a half foot area coming up they are probably about three inches to four inches now not thick though but I don't know when I should transplant them I don't want to put them into shock or do I need to thin them down so the more healthier ones can grow yeah, so you're not going to keep those in the box, correct? No, I started them inside from seed. This is the first time I've ever done that. 
Okay. And I don't know when exactly I need to take them. I know I can't put them outside yet. Yeah. But. So what you want to do is harden them off. Um, and that's a process of taking them outside a little bit each day, like an hour the first day, just so they can start getting used to the sun and the wind and the rain and all of these things. And you do this process called hardening off. Um, and then, um, but you do want to make sure to thin them out. So you're, if they're still that little, your tomatoes and peppers, you can separate them and just plant them in other pots. Um, they usually separate pretty easily and at that small stage will still survive. But they won't go into shock being that little then when you transfer, go to transplant them over to a as, different container. Yeah, as long as you keep them inside for a little bit longer then. Yep. And then the lettuce I would just thin out and nibble microgreens. Good question. Uh, what is the earliest tomato to harvest? Gosh, um, I don't know. Um, that would be a question because there are literally hundreds of different varieties of tomatoes. So that would be a question of just looking at how long it takes to go from um, seed to harvest um, and deciding what size you want. Cherry tomatoes are a little bit quicker than your big ones, um, but that's, um, you just have to look through those seed catalogs. How often should plants be watered using a timed garden hose? Great question. Generally, plants like to get about an inch to an inch and a half of water a week, and you want to do that over about two to three waterings a week. Um, and you want to take into consideration any of the rain that we get. Um, so just, um, it's, it really shouldn't be timed, <laughs> is what we recommend. Um, but two to three times a week, and then don't water if it's been raining. Um, and going for that inch to inch and a half of water. Uh, my garden is 44 feet wide. Ran east-west. Should I partition the garden for any reason? No, I don't think so. Depends on what you want to grow, right? Um, that might be a little bit more in-depth question. So if you want to send that to me or the Master Gardeners, we can help you a little bit more. Uh, I keep an upside down bottle filled with water in my containers to keep them watered. Yes, that's a great tactic to be able to use. Um, I, I tried that once um, and it worked really, really well. And then I just forget to put it back in there. <laughs> Is this area good for the Three Sisters plantings? Yes, absolutely. Three Sisters planting is great. So it's using the corn, beans, and squash, and you plant them all at once, and the corn grows, and the beans grow up the corn, and then the squash covers the ground. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I had a question when rotating crops, how far away from last year's planting should they be? They just shouldn't be in the same spot. So making sure just to move them to a different spot. Just it, not right on top of each other, like even just a foot over is generally fine for most things. How can I grow cilantro? I have no luck with it. I'm sorry that you don't have luck with it. I, that stuff goes to seed for me. Um, if you, I don't know exactly what your problem is, but if you wanna, Sandra, if you're still on here and you wanna send me an email, we can talk more about it. I plant sweet corn, pumpkins, and watermelons in my raised beds. Yep, those would all do great in raised beds, absolutely. If I am needing compost, can I purchase some or how quickly can I make it? Uh, purchase compost is um, a great product to be able to use because you know that it's been um, composted correctly. There's not a lot of um, that's guaranteed to be free of diseases and free of seeds, weed seeds. Um, if you want to make your own, it depends on what kind of system you have. There's whole classes about composting. Um, you can do it in a closed system or an open system. An open system usually takes um, a season or two to be able to produce good compost. A closed season can produce compost, like one of the enclosed barrels can produce compost in uh, a couple of months. Uh, if you're building a raised garden, can you use treated lumber? 
I wouldn't recommend it if you're using it for food crops because that treated um, the stuff that they use to treat the lumber can leach into the soil and can um, get into the food that you're growing. For ideas for raised gardens, um, there's just a quick Google search. There's so many different ideas. We, a couple of days ago, Nathan and I were sharing ideas on different raised garden um, things. There's so many different resources out there. Uh, are praying mantises good for pest control? They are good for pest control, but they eat everything, including beneficials. So I do like praying mantids and I do leave them when I see them, but also know that if you're releasing them, um, it's going to be a bit challenging because they're going to also eat your beneficials and your pollinators as well. Where do you take your soil to be tested? Great question. Um, it just so happens that Purdue Extension Allen County takes um, soil tests. So I can put a link for that into the Backyard Gardening Basics Helpful Links on how to take a really good soil test um, and then where to take it. Um, it's 20 bucks a test and then um, we can help you analyze the results if you need if you have any questions about that. And Terry, real quick, sorry, I keep interrupting. Um, what sort of things do they test for? Is it just problem stuff or is it like the nutrients that the plants would actually need? That's a great question. So the soil tests that we do are for nutrients. Um, that is, it'll tell us what um, the big nutrients that we're looking for is NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Um, and it'll tell us, tell you what those levels are at. It also looks at calcium and magnesium um, and other different nutrients that the plants need. So um, it'll give you a really good um, understanding of what kind of nutrients that you have. And that if you have, don't have enough nutrients, that can be where you have problems too. So it could solve some problems along the way. Okay, and then when they bring those in, is there a special bag they have to put it in or do they um, have to, or can they just like grab a shovel full and walk it into the building? Well, there's a certain way to be able to take the soil test and that information is online and I'll get it up on that document. Um, where to take it, how deep to take it, um, all that information. And then you can bring it in in a baggie, in a bucket. Um, and it, then once you come to the office, we put it in a special bag. Uh, whoa, do carrots need a little different soil than lavender, tomatoes? Carrots need, generally they like soil that is a little um, uh, not clay. <laughs> they need soil that um, is able to be broken apart a little bit more for some of those bigger uh, carrot varieties. Um, lavender or tomatoes can grow in almost anything, but because it's a root, it needs to go and mine through the root. So it likes soil that's a little bit loamier is what we call it. So it's just a little bit softer. But there are some great carrot varieties that can go through some of our carrot um, or some of our soil profiles. So um, they have a variety that's like a ball. It's called a Paris market. Um, and it doesn't go very deep in the soil. And any of the red core Chatonnet carrot varieties can do really, really well in clay soils because it just goes right through. Um, it's a sturdier carrot that can go right through the soil. Um, yeah, it's hard to find. So still having trouble finding seed potatoes. It is hard to find those seed potatoes right now, given our current situation and what we've got. Everybody wants potatoes. Um, I would recommend checking out um, some, I heard like some Amish places in the area might have seed potatoes still. Um, do a shout out on social media. Some people may be able to help um, locate where you can find seed potatoes. Can you talk about starting tomatoes that have eyes? Yeah, you wanna make sure that when you plant potatoes, um, that you want to have the eyes is what they're called. So that's that little indent that um, goes into the potato and it's where it starts to grow. So you wanna make sure that any potato you put in the ground has two to three of those eyes, the little indents, um, and that's where the plant is gonna grow and then produce more, um, more potatoes and bigger plant. Now, 
Terry, we only have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, it's almost 3.30. Um, is there, for a person who went through this and is still not entirely sure to where to start or what the next step is, uh, can you give any pointers or point them towards uh, other resources that can kind of get them off on the right foot? Um, yeah. So take a look at what you have, do an inventory, and just really just sit down and look at what you have to work with and come up with a plan. Um, look at where the sun is, look at what space you have available, and then just start planning stuff. You know what? If it doesn't work, you learn something and you're going to do something new next year or later in the season. The one thing that I love about plants is that if you kill them, they're not going to really come back at you at all. Um, there's not a lot of bad things that'll happen if you accidentally killed a plant. I know a lot of people have a hard time with killing plants. I got no problem with it because I know I can probably go and find it again. Um, so I think the biggest thing is knowing that failure doesn't mean anything because you get to try again. There's always another season. There's always another opportunity. And if you're looking for more resources, the Master Gardener Hotline can help. Um, but there's also on that helpful links, there's um, a section of Purdue Extension online resources for gardeners. Tons of information in there. Um, and then I also had a question here from Leslie. Does this count towards Master Gardener Education Hours? Of course this does. We have a great group of Master Gardeners. Can, can you explain a little bit about what the Master Gardeners are? What are these uh, hours they're talking about? Yeah, the Master Gardeners are a, a wonderful um, group of plant nerds that adore growing things. So if you find yourself wanting to find other plant lovers and um, join one of the coolest clubs in town, that would be the Master Gardener program. It's a volunteer-based program. It starts off with an intense class and training that gives you all of the tools to be able to go out into the community and help others grow. And it's an opportunity to give back through your community through um, horticulture and gardening education. Um, and then you continue with the program through doing education opportunities such as this one um, and going out and volunteering in the community. And from, um, there's also information on how, um, how to join the Ex Purdue Extension Master Gardeners of Island County on that helpful hints sheet. All right. Well, it's almost 3.30. Any last minute questions? I didn't have any stumpers, did I? I got them all, right? All right, guys. So once this is all done, we'll go ahead and pop a recording up onto that Google Drive once we get it processed. So you can watch this till your heart's content and if there's any information you want to get back at. Um, and then make sure to look at those resources and download those fact sheets too. Um, thank you all for joining me. This was a fantastic experience. Um, and also check out your email. I'm going to send out some follow-up surveys to see what you guys learned and what you guys want to hear next. If, and if you want me to do this again for you guys.